speak, where the Bible speaks, be silent, where the Bible's silent, do Bible things in Bible ways, speak, where the Bible speaks, be silent, where the Bible's silent, call Bible things by Bible names, we must have a for all things religious, we must have authority from God's own word. Thus saith the Lord should drive all of our choices when worshiping the Father who created all. Speak, where the Bible speaks, be silent. Where the Bible's silent, do Bible things in Bible ways. Speak, where the Bible speaks, be silent. Where the Bible's silent, call Bible things by Bible names. Our love of the Father is shown in our choices. It's shown when we strive to obey His Word. We lead by example when we offer praises, when worshiping the Father who created all. Speak, where the Bible speaks, be silent. Where the Bible's silent, do Bible things. In Bible ways, speak. Where the Bible speaks, be silent. Where the Bible's silent, call Bible things by Bible names. God loves us enough to reveal what's expected. His church is described in His holy word. The order, the practice, the doctrine and reverence. We're worshiping the Father who created all. Speak, where the Bible speaks, be silent. Where the Bible's silent, do Bible things in Bible ways. Speak. Where the Bible speaks, be silent. Where the Bible's silent, call Bible things by Bible names. Did you know the story of Jesus who loves you? Jesus who died for you, Jesus can save you. Did you know that he's the one, son of the one God, son of the living God, Jesus can save you. Jesus all day, Jesus every day, Jesus when I go to bed, Jesus when I wake, I want to live a life so I hear him say, well done my child, enter in. Did you know that there is a tomb that is empty? Death could not hold the king, Jesus is living. Did you know that he was seen after God raised him? Then he ascended up, Jesus is living. Jesus all day, Jesus every day. Jesus when I go to bed, Jesus when I wake. I want to live a life so I hear him say, Well done, my child. Enter Did you know that Jesus made one way to save you? Answer the gospel call, go in the water. It is in the water where we are united. In death with Christ the King, go in the water. Jesus all day, Jesus every day, Jesus when I go to bed, Jesus when I wake, I want to live a life so I hear him say, well done my child, enter in. After you obey it is time to get busy.
Z. Now let us work for him. Go make disciples. Help us teach the world and then baptize the willing. Teach them all to observe all he's commanded. Jesus all day. Jesus every day. Jesus when I go to bed. Jesus when I wake. I want to live a life so I hear him say, Well done, my child. Enter in.
Would y'all bow with me? Our God and Father in heaven, Father, we come to you this evening, and we're so grateful for the cooler temperatures that you blessed us with. Father, we're grateful for the moisture that you're sending our ways. And Father, we know that in recent days we've been praying a lot for you to send moisture, and you're, you're doing that. And Father, we just want to pause right now and thank you so much for that moisture, for the cooler temperatures. And Father, we uh, at this time also want to pray for those that we mentioned a moment ago that are uh, having health issues, and we want to par- pray for Terry Gray's mother, and we pray that they can uh, do these surgeries and that she can get better. Father, we also want to pray for Cynthia Shepard uh, Acton. Uh, this is June's niece. We pray, Father, that uh, as she's been facing this diagnosis of leukemia, or excuse me, lymphoma, Father, that the doctors uh, can determine a good course of action and get that treated as quickly as possible. Father, we're gra- glad that Frank Lott is doing better, and we pray that he'll just continue to get better and better. Father, we also know that we have a lot of activities that are coming up and we're getting ready for the lectureship. And Father, we pray that we can work together as a group of Christians and we can accomplish those goals that have been set. And Father, that we can reach out into our community and bring more souls to your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, at this time, as we begin to sing these songs of praise to your great and matchless name, Father, we pray that you will take our song service, our sacrifice of our lips, that it'll be a sweet and uh, sweet-smelling savor unto you. Father, we know that without Jesus Christ, that none of the things that we enjoy would be possible, especially those spiritual blessings that we enjoy as Christians. And Father, at this time, we do want to pause and ask that if we've done anything that would be wrong in your eyes that as we repent of it father that we can stand pure and holy in your sight once again so that we can offer up these words of praise and father we offer this prayer in jesus name amen brother don before we sing this song i got a confession to make one of the members came up and asked me if I would lead it this Sunday night. And I looked at it and I said, well, you know what? I ain't never heard that song before and this is one we're talking about. But I, I told that I would give it a try. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna give it a try. It, as I, I looked at the notes and read the music, I said it is a beautiful song and it kind of reminds us of what our mission is to tell people about Jesus. Number 860, he is my everything. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me made everything new he is my everything now how about you some folks may ask me some folks may say who is this jesus you talk about every day he is my savior he set me free now listen while i tell you what he means to me everything he is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me, made everything new. He is my everything. Now, how about you? What do you know? We got-
got through it. Didn't do too bad. I'm glad y'all knew it. I know we know this one, number 822. Heaven came down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with light from above into God's family divine. Justified freely through Jeffrey's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made. When as a sinner I came, took of the offer of grace he to proffer. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed. Away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Rich is eternal and blessing supernal. From his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were that song? I sure can. I sure enough can. Hymn of Invitation will be number 588. Sinners Jesus will receive. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir.
All right, so we're going to continue with our harmony of the gospel, but as we've been doing over the last several weeks, uh, we spend a few moments talking about archaeology and how uh, archaeology is confirming the Word of God over and over again, and it was brought up about the Dead Sea Scrolls last week, so I thought I'd take a few moments to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is a picture of one of the caves. This is numbered cave number 11, uh, and this is one of almost 30 caves that they found that had these uh, writings in them, and we'll talk more about the writings in just a moment. But it wasn't just the writings. They found coins that date to the time just after the time of Christ. Uh, they also found, this is arrowheads that they found in these caves. As we mentioned last week, and uh, Sharon sent out an email about it. If you didn't get that, you can go back and look at it. Uh, but they found four Roman soldiers, or excuse me, Roman soldiers. They were old. <laughs> Four Roman swords, that's what I'm trying to say, four Roman swords, and uh, they didn't find the soldiers, but they found the swords that the soldiers carried, and they were hidden in the back of a cave, and as we talked about, they think this was probably from one of the revolts that took place, either the Maccabean revolt uh, that happened just before the time of Christ, or maybe another revolt closer to the time when the apostles were alive but they think that they stole these four swords and hid them in a cave. And they said when they pulled them out of the sheath that they were almost in perfect condition. Just absolutely mind-boggling. So let's think about uh, this cave. Here's an actual picture of some of the scrolls that they found in one of those caves. And we'll talk more about the scrolls in just a moment. Here is the terrain that we're talking about. This is cave number 27. And uh, if you can spot Cave 27, let me know. <laughs> well, and that's what I thought, but I, I, I assume that's it, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so Cave 27, this is another picture of another set of caves. Like we said, they found about 30 of these caves that have either scrolls or some kind of things that date back to that time period that we're talking about. Many of them they found were actually in these clay pots. And uh, so that helped preserve them a little bit. This is a very dry climate. It doesn't have a lot of moisture in the air. So things tend, like bodies tend to mummify. And the things that they found, uh, just uh, some of them in remarkable condition. Uh, this is not the actual scroll that they pulled out. This is a, a computer, if I understand right, a computer generated picture of what that scroll looks like. This is the scroll of Isaiah. And it's almost 24 foot in length when they rolled it out. It's almost 24 feet in length. It's about two, uh, if I remember right, about two feet tall. And so they unrolled this scroll and they looked at it and here's the part that I find that is absolute, well, I'll talk about this more. Uh, so this was found, that Isaiah, they call it the Great Isaiah Scroll, found in Qumran Cave Number 1, dates back to just before the time of Christ. It is written on parchment, which is a kind of paper that they used at that time. And it says the Great Isaiah Scroll is one of the original seven Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in Qumran in 1947. So they've been looking from about 1947 to about 1956, and they've found about 30 caves that have scrolls and other artifacts that are in them. They're still looking today. As I mentioned a moment ago, these four swords that were found were just found last week or maybe the week before. So they're still investigating. You can imagine if you went into like Arizona, uh, to the desert part of Arizona and started going and seeing all these canyons, all the caves that would be there, it's going to take you a while to explore them. And so that's what they're finding as they did this. So this is the largest scroll that they found, 734 centimeters. Like I say, if I remember right, that's close to 24 feet when you roll it out. It is the best preserved 
of all the scrolls that they found, and it's the only one that they found that is almost completely intact. It is almost complete. There are 54 columns. Now watch this. It contains all of what we call the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. Now you know at that time they didn't break it down by chapters. Uh, and so um, the scroll actually has what we would consider all 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. Uh, so uh, let's see. Let me go to this page. I know the, the text is a little bit small, and I apologize for that. But what I wanted to do here on this side, the left side, is actually a translation of that scroll that we're looking at. By the way, that scroll starts over here in Isaiah chapter, what we would call chapter 1, and it would go chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, because they read things backwards, or at least as we would look at it, it would be backwards. I don't, I don't think they use punctuation or It depends, yeah, it depends on uh, what time period you're looking at, but yes, uh, they didn't. So what's interesting about this, and y'all turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. So on the left side, and uh, let me look at the guy's name. The man who translated is Professor Peter Flint along with Eugene Ulrich, both of them professors and obviously scholars in the Hebrew language. So on the left side, you have the actual text from the Dead Sea Scroll. On the right side, you have the, what's called the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is the one that the King James translators used. Um, so uh, look at this. Isaiah chapter 1 begins, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now... Obviously, y'all may not can see this, but here is the translation from the Dead Sea Scroll. Okay, so we're reading from the Dead Sea Scroll, the one they uncovered. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and then we would say Hezekiah. There's a, there's a difference in spelling of the name Hezekiah. So they don't know if that was actually a mistake, that uh, somebody, as they were copying it, misspelled Hezekiah's name, or if this was another name that was similar to Hezekiah as uh, one of the uh, kings of Israel, his name was Jehoram and Joram. So he had two names. So they, they say maybe this is a second name for King Isaiah or Hezekiah that we just don't know about. But it says, kings of Judah, verse 2, he says, Hear heavens and listen earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children I have nourished and raised, but they have rebelled against me. I hope you're following along in, in your uh, translation here of the King James and notice how close this is. Now, brethren, this dates back before the time of Christ. This is the oldest manuscript that has ever been discovered of the book of Isaiah. And so, by the way, it's not going to really be that far past the time that Isaiah actually wrote this. Isaiah wrote this about 750 years before the time of Christ. So we're getting pretty close to that time. Verse 3, The ox knows its owner, and the ass its master's manger. Israel does not know and my people does not un-ND. And so if you notice, I know you probably can't see that there's a little bracket. So some of the word is where they can't read it. But they have filled in, as you normally would do, does not understand. And they've got it spelled U-N-D-E-R. Well, they've got it spelled right. I was thinking they had a little difference in the spelling. But they're not, they, it, it, there's a blank there. So you can, <laughs> if I were to give you a puzzle, and I would give you the sentence, 
my people does not UN ND with a blank in the middle, you would write understand, right? I mean, that's kind of self-evident. So that's what they've done on verse 3. Number 4, ah, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, seed of evildoers, corrupt children, they have abandoned the Lord. And again, it just says L-O there in the scroll. And they can't read the other two letters, but they filled in R-D, Lord, because that only makes sense. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are estranged, gone backward. Why would you still, and here's another one of those blanks they filled in the I-L-L, why would you still be beaten that you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart weak from the sole of the foot to the head, or to head, there is no healthy spot, but bruises and sores and bleeding wounds they have not pressed out, nor bound up, nor softened with oil. I just did the first six verses. This text is almost 100% identical with the King James Version. And I point that out because there have been those that have attacked the King James Version. Well, it's outdated. The language is old. This text brings out, this is the way they were writing and talking during the time just before Jesus comes to this earth. Amen. So, so this, this to me just verifies that what the king, and see what they say about the King James. Well, it didn't have some of the older manuscripts that we have now. Okay? In 1947, that theory was blown right out of the water because they found this scroll of Isaiah. They rolled it out, they read it, and it matched almost verbatim the King James. So the Masoretic text, which is on the right side, and it varies a little bit different because they translated, the King James translated, from this Masoretic text. So the Masoretic text says the prophecies instead of the visions. The prophecies, which would be the same thing. We're, we're talking about words that have the same meaning. Uh, trying to think of a good example of that, but we all realize that you have words that can be translated differently that have the very same meaning, and that's what we're talking about with this. So it's the prophecies of Isaiah, son of Amos, who prophesied concerning Jerusalem, or Judah and Jerusalem in the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. I'm not going to read the rest of that Masoretic text, but brethren... This is a beautiful example of how God has preserved His Word up until this present day. And I'm thankful that men have dedicated their lives. By the way, they have a note up here. I mentioned this before. It says up here at the top that uh, the numeric organizations of chapters into verses does not appear in this great Isaiah scroll. So it doesn't have verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4 like it's broken down on this chart. And they go on to explain why. Because these were not introduced into the, the translations till the English translation, a man by the name of Stephen Langton who lived in the, third, uh, the 12th and 13th centuries. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's the actual one that put the verses in there. So the verses go back to the 12th and 13th century. So that goes back a long ways. He says also the chapter headings were added by Peter Flint to help you read. So those chapter breakdowns where it says the case against Judah, rebellious kings, Judah, that was added by these translators. So we understand. But the scroll is almost verbatim. So I find that fascinating. fascinating. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. It is. Acts chapter 8, the, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. Very same, very same. He was reading from a scroll of Isaiah. And I don't know if his was 24 feet long or not. <laughs> uh, because what happened, and you see this in, uh, 
especially in the, the English translations, we have First and Second Samuel. And I pointed this out before. The reason we have First and Second Samuel is because they were so long that they couldn't put them on a scroll. The scroll got so big, so they broke it into two scrolls. So what you actually have, when you would say it like they would say it, you've got scroll, first scroll of Samuel, second scroll of Samuel. We call it first and second Samuel. Same thing with first and second Kings. They were too long, so they broke the scrolls. And so you would have one scroll that would have the first half and then the second half. So that's why we have first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, this is fascinating stuff to me, and uh, again, I appreciate y'all's interest in this. I've got good reviews on this, and uh, we'll keep doing it unless y'all get bored. So let's turn our attention now to the text that we're looking at. We had a couple of questions last week, and so uh, I want to go back and cover those. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5. You know... Uh, there's, a, there's an old saying, the well-laid plans of men and mice. <laughs> I was hoping we could go through <laughs> and not spend a lot of time on these verses, just read them, but there's been too many questions for us to do that. So we're looking now at what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus taught about retaliation. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. And then he talked about loving your enemies, beginning in Matthew 5, verse 43 through verse 48. So let's read what Jesus said about retaliation, and then we'll talk about it. I hope y'all studied, as I encourage you to do, uh, up on this. He says in verse 38, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye shall uh, not resist evil, or uh, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel, compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So this is what we call the Sermon on the Mount, obviously, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. So Jesus said, you have heard... Oh, I got these out of order. Let me... Let me uh, I'll have to go back. I apologize for that. About retaliation. So what we want to first talk about is retaliation as it was under the law of Moses, and then we'll talk about what Jesus said. So as we've talked about, the law of Moses governed the nation of Israel. It was not only their religious governance, but it also governed them civilly. This is going to come into play in this discussion on retaliation. So under the Old Testament... If someone harmed someone else, they were to receive a similar wound. Now, obviously, there were laws about if it's accidental, it's not going to have the same kind of punishment. But if I intentionally poked out Don Bentley's eye, then Jesus said an eye for an eye or a tooth for tooth is what the Old Testament law said. So I poke out his eyes. He gets to poke my eye out. And uh, that was the law of retaliation. Why? Because under the Old Testament, if I gouged his eye out, he didn't dial 911 and bring a police officer, and the police officer arrests me, and the policeman then take me before the judge, and then the judge brings all this. They didn't have that kind of law system. So you retaliate, somebody knocks your eye out, you knock their eye out. That's the way it was under the Old Testament law because it governed them civilly and religiously. This obviously is a civil, although it has moral implications, it's a civil matter. And so that's why the Old Testament law said what it said. So let's turn to Exodus 21, Exodus chapter 21. And we'll begin in verse number, let's see, 12. Exodus 21 and verse 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. 
And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. Now notice the difference between accidental death and murder. I accidentally killed somebody. God said, I'm going to put a place for you to go plead your cause. We call that the cities of refuge. There were six. Six. There was three on one side of the Jordan, the east side, three on the west side, uh, two up in the north, two in the middle, two down south on both sides of the river. So six cities. So if you accidentally murdered someone, remember the nation of Israel is about, it's less than 200 miles long. So we're not talking about, so if you accidentally killed someone, you don't have to travel from here to New York to get to a refu city of refuge. You might have to travel from here to maybe Kaufman, but that's about as far as you're going to have to travel. You're not going to, probably not even all the way to Dallas. These cities are very close. So he says... If a man, verse 14, come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. So you murder someone, you're going to die. That's the Old Testament law of murder. He goes on to say, And he that smiteth his father or mother shall surely be put to death. You slap your mother, you die. Pretty good. Uh, uh, that, that keeps kids, teenage punks, from getting out of line, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, uh, you, you want to bow up and back talk your mama and slap your mama? Knock yourself out, but you'll die. That was the Old Testament law. So he says in verse 16, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or he that be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Do you get tired of people saying the Bible con condones slavery? What did he just say? You go out and you steal a man and force him to work as a slave, what was the penalty? Death. You buy that man from somebody and start working him as a slave. What was the penalty? Death. So here's the point, brethren. There are different forms of slavery. There is what we would call in our vernacular indentured servitude. We saw this in the founding of this nation. You're a young man in Ireland and you want to come to America. You have no money. And a guy says, look, I'm a blacksmith. I will pay for you to go to America but you will work for me for seven years to pay off your debt. That is a form of indentured servitude or technically a form of slavery. That is not condemned in the Word of God. That's not condemned at all. You take a person prisoner in war, you could make them a slave because this was a war, because God sanctioned that as you go to war. A person that has committed a crime is punished by going to jail, and the way it's designed in the Bible, not the way it's designed now in our society, it used to be this way, you worked and you paid off your debt. So if you caused $10,000 worth of damage, you worked and paid that damage off. And a part of that went not only to the prison system, but a part of it went to the family that you actually harmed. Uh, I remember when I was a kid growing up that the Texas penal system was completely self-supporting. It did not get a dime from taxpayer dollars. They worked those men. They had jobs for them to do. And they paid them, and it was not a whole lot of money, but you're in there cutting out license plates and making license plates and you paid off your debt to society. So they worked those men and those men paid their debt to society. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. But not all slavery is condemned in the Bible. But what we call now chattel slavery, where you go in and you take a man 
and you force him to be your slave is condemned in both the New Testament and the Old Testament. Paul talks about it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He talks about men stealers. That's what we're talking about. Those that would go in and slay. He were forced. Forced. That's right. Yeah. So that is condemned in the Word of God, and we just read it. He that stealeth a man and selleth him. 1 Timothy, y'all turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And notice the similarity of the language. 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to be down about verse number 10. The law, he says, is not made for a righteous man, verse number 9, but for the lawless and disobedient. He says, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, verse 10, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers. That's exactly what we just read. The man that steals another man and sells him. That's what Paul is condemning here. So this idea that, uh, oh, the Bible condones chattel slavery. Well, you ain't reading the same Bible I am. Because God said the punishment for that is death. That's what He said. So anyway, verse 17, He that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. And if men strive together, and one smiteth another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed. In other words, you injure him bad enough, the man has to spend a month in his bed to recover. Well, what do you do? Verse 19, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit or repaid, only he shall pay for the loss of time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. So you knock somebody in the head because you're mad at them with a rock and they spend two months in bed recovering, you got to pay for all that. That's what he said right here. You're going to repay that because you caused that harm. He says... Uh, Let's see, and if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. So you beat one of your servants until they die, you're going to be punished for that, right? He says, uh, notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. He is saying here that if the man is only injured for a day or two, then, okay, you beat him, you're not going to do it again, but that was the punishment. Verse 22, if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely be punished according to the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. If any mischief follow, then ye shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Let's go back to verse 22. If two men are striving and they hit a woman and it says her fruit departs. So what we would say is in this striving, they cause this child to be born early. We all know that sometimes a, an accident, a woman's involved in an accident and the child, because of the trauma to the mother, is delivered early. So what does he say? Well, if no mischief follow, so the child comes out, it's early, but the child is fine, the mother's fine, then okay, then there's, it's okay, you're not going to punish, a man's going to be punished, whatever the husband says, but notice if mischief follow. So if the child is deformed because of the uh, striving of these two men, that child is harmed when it comes out, or if the mother continues to have problems, then here's what it says. The husband determines what that man is going to pay. Now again, does that sound like the Bible puts a premium on life and even life of an unborn? 
you cause this child to be born early, if that child dies, then that man is going to die punishment, his death. If there's other damage, whatever it is, he goes into this eye for eye, two for two, whatever damage was done to the child or the mother, then he's going to have to pay damages for what he's done. So that's the Old Testament law. And boy, we're running out of time quickly, so let's move. Uh, so in the case of murder, I know y'all quit laughing. God allowed the closest relative to carry out the execution. This is Numbers 35 and verse number 15. So if somebody murders my brother, and I am the closest one, closest relationship, God said it's my job to go and kill the murderer. But He also says that you cannot, Numbers 35 and verse 9, do it with malice. Now, I don't, that's a fine line to walk. Somebody murders your brother and God says you got to kill him. Well, brother, I love you, but I'm going to kill you anyway. That's going to be hard to do without malice in your heart. But God said that's the way that you do it. That's the way that you have to do it. This is the reason, as we say, the cities of refuge came into being. So now let's move to what Jesus taught. Under the law of Christ, it's going to be different. Why? Well, first off, the law of Christ is for the church, and it is spiritual. It is not civil law. The New Testament is not civil law. That's the distinction, or at least one of the distinctions, between the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament was their civil law and religious law. The New Testament is our religious law, but it's not our civil law because Christians are going to come from various governments. And so we're not instituting Christian law in every time we go out and convert people. That's not what we're doing. So in the New Testament, Christians do not carry out punishment like they did in the Old Testament. That was because it was a civil law as well as a religious law. So the word retaliation means to revenge for a wrong or even, we're talking about the clinical definition of perceived wrong. It's what retaliation is. Well, I think uh, Alan did it, but I don't know, but I'm going to carry it out anyway. Well, that's, that's retaliation, but I may be wrong in doing it because it may not have been Alan. It might have been my wife. I don't know. So God forbids this type of conduct. He says, don't do that. Jesus even says, if someone wrongs you to go the extra mile with that individual. And it's interesting that he said, if someone compels you to go a mile, go with him twain. Well, what is he talking about? Under the, the, uh, during the time of Christ and the New Testament, y'all know this, Israel was under the rule of the Roman government. A Roman soldier in a foreign land, he's carrying his 100-pound sack, and he sees uh, Doyle over there, and he says, hey, you got to carry my sack for a mile. They could do that. They could tell you, a Roman soldier walk up to you and say, carry my pack for a mile, and you've got to do it. Or if you've got the money, you can pay somebody to help you. But you do that. Well, Jesus said, if the Roman soldier does that to you, go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. That's what New Testament Christianity is all about, going the extra mile. We talked about it yesterday, and I, I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up. We'll talk about swearing, Lord willing, next week. We talked about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And God's law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9, that if a person commits adultery, the innocent party can put them away. But as we pointed out yesterday... You don't have to divorce them. You, you can forgive them and go the extra mile. You can do that. He doesn't say you have to do that, but you can do that. So then that gets to the question always comes up, well, what about self-defense? So I'm laying in my bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I hear the glass breaking, and I, I wake up, and there's a guy with a gun. What do I do? Do I say, okay. Uh, I've got another house over here about 10 miles. Let's go get everything out of that house too. Is that, going the other, is that going the extra mile? Is that what Jesus is talking about? That's not what He's talking about at all. Look at Luke 22. I 
And I know I've talked a lot, and I apologize for that. Luke 22, verse 35. Jesus, and, and we're skipping a lot, but He says in verse 35, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then He said unto them, But now... He that hath the purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Why would Jesus tell them to sell your garment and buy a sword if he didn't intend for them to use it? Paul used it a lot. Used his sword? So are you going to have to show me a verse for that one? <laughs> and I know what Cliff is saying. And here is the difference that I, would, that I would say. When Paul submitted to punishments like that, it was for preaching the gospel. And brethren, I've, I've said for many, many years that if Muslims burst in our doors right now, while we're having a worship service. And they are going to kill us because we are Christians. I would not fight against that. I would not fight against it. If I'm stoned for preaching the truth, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to fight against that. But why would Jesus tell them buy a sword and then say, now you keep that in the scabbard and don't ever use it, if there wasn't an instance where Jesus saw that they might have to use that sword to defend themselves from robbers or somebody else. I think that's what he's talking about. So I, in my mind, here's the distinction that I'm trying to draw. There's a difference between religious persecution and thuggery. A guy breaks into your house at 2 o'clock in the morning. He is not there because you're a Christian. He's there because he wants what you have. And Jesus, I think, gave us the opportunity, if we would choose to do that, to defend ourselves. Uh, he says, um, in verse 37, I say unto you that this is written, uh, that this that is written must be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, and for the things concerning me to have an end. So what Jesus tells them in verse 37, when these guys come in to take me, you don't fight against them. Peter does. Peter pulls out his sword and cuts off Malchus's ear. And as I've said many times, I don't think he was aiming for his ear. I think he was trying to kill the guy. And Jesus had just told him, this is what God has said. You don't fight against it. And Peter being the impetuous person that he often was, decided to fight. And that's why Jesus said, put your sword up. He had just told him to buy a sword. Just now, a chapter later, he's going to tell Peter, put that sword up. So there's got to be a distinction, a difference between the two. And so they said in verse 38, we have two swords. Here are two swords. And Jesus said, well, that's enough. Don't go out and buy a hundred swords and raise an army and go out marching through the land to conquer the land for Christ. That's Islam. It's not Christianity. Okay, so I've opened up a whole can of worms. So uh, anybody want to go fishing? <laughs> I got plenty of worms laid out, so anybody got any comments, questions? Okay, so the verse you're talking about is Romans 14, I assume. Is that where you're, that you're coming from? So how do we reconcile when Jesus tells them to buy two swords? I guess this is the question. You buy two swords, and yet Jesus said, Love your enemies. So, what does it mean to love your enemy? Well, not all your enemies are going to try and kill you. You know, we got enemies, uh, you know, and cults and all that kind of stuff. 
stuff, but they're not trying to uh, come and shoot us dead, or that's kind of the way I see it. Okay. Of course, we pray for those people, but you know, if they come in there uh, trying to kill you, I'm listening. Okay. Nobody comes. Uh, I understand what you're saying. Another religious group comes okay. here and says, I'm going to kill you because you're Christian. Okay. So, so. Some thug comes in here, some mentally off person comes in and just starts wanting to kill us because we're a soft target. Okay. Yeah. So, so. so, so So, so this is found in other places, but in Matthew 5, 43, you have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be your children, or may be children of your Father which is in heaven." Uh, we're not going to read that because that's next week. <laughs> so, Cliff, we'll come back and I will try to explain how I'd understand love your enemies. Now, a part of that has to be, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this caveat up right now. When Jesus, or excuse me, when Moses told the children of Israel that somebody murders your brother and you're the one that is to kill him, what did he tell them you can't have in your heart when you kill him? Anger, malice, retaliation, retribution. So, revenge. So, here's the, what I'm trying to get across. It is not necessarily unloving to put somebody to death. It's not necessarily, and Cliff, I, I think that's getting to the point that you're drawing from. G, under the Old Testament law, you put a murderer to death. A murderer to death. He's killed your brother. The punishment that he deserves according to God is death. And you've got to be the executioner. But you can't do it out of anger and malice and hatred. So did you love that person? You don't want to do it, but you have that do. I would not want to be an executioner. But I would hope that if it came down to the point where I did have to take a human life, that I would do it not out of anger and malice, but as I said, defending someone that I love. And I think that's part of the difference, and we can talk more about it next week. Uh, I think there's a part of the difference. Just because someone is punished doesn't mean you don't love them. Yes, sir, Lee. Love him. Uh huh. Yes. Are, to some extent, our enemies. Yes. And we are to take the gospel to them. Yes. To try to bring them into. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, that's a part of it. And those folks aren't trying to kill us. Right. There's a difference. You know, somebody trying to blow your head off. So. Yes, and that's what I'm trying to get at. Under the Old Testament law, even though it was the individual's brother that carried it out, they were doing what God told them to do. And they were not doing it out of revenge and retribution. And again, I don't know how you do that. I really don't. I, I don't know if somebody murders one of your children and you're the, the one that God said you're the avenger of the blood and you've got to go out and kill that person. But... Yeah. And by the way, there are examples of people who did it in revenge. And I, I guess uh, Joab, who was 
David's general and Solomon's general. He drew a man, a man out of a city of refuge. We'll talk about this next week. He enticed a man out of the city of refuge and when he went to shook his hand, stabbed him with a knife. And guess what? Solomon had him executed later. So, so <laughs> uh, yeah. Did Joab do it out of malice? Yes. And was he guilty of blood? Yes. Even though he was the one charged with killing the man, he did it in an ungodly way and he died. So, yep. Yeah. But you're right, we love these people, we want the gospel to them. Okay, is anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh huh. The church today. If you're in the Lord's house, if you're in the church, uh, take your uh, swords and spears and put them in the pruning hooks and plowshares. So, if I understand what you're saying, when he told Peter to put up his sword, what he meant was for everybody put up your sword and never pick one up, even though he just told them to buy some. Well, I don't see the. Okay. Okay. And he told that to Peter. He didn't say that to all of us. He told that to Peter. But we'll we'll come back to that next week. So y'all be prepared because obviously there's going to be discussion. <laughs> and it is. It is good. And we love discussion. Well, I really do. And I I, I don't have one bone of animosity about Cliff. I understand where he's coming from. So we, we, we will talk more about it, Lord willing, next week. So uh, I'm just going to say, Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, the one who believes and baptized shall be saved. If you are not a New Testament Christian, as Cliff mentioned a moment ago, the house of the Lord, the, the mountain of the Lord's house is the church, and we want you to be a member of the church, and we don't want to kill you. We want you to be a member of the Lord's church, and we want you to go to heaven, and we want you to spend an eternity with us and God in heaven. So if you've never obeyed the gospel, Don's going to lead us in an invitation song, and we are pleading with you. We don't want you to be our enemy. We want to love you. And, and that goes, by the way, to homosexuals and murderers and adulterers. We love you. We want you to come home. And you got to repent. That's exactly right. So uh, if you never obeyed the gospel, then we encourage you to obey the gospel. As a child of God, if you have a need, please come as we stand and as we sing. Sinners Jesus will receive. Yeah. Sinners Jesus will receive. Sound this word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leaves all who linger all who fall <clears throat> sing it o'er and o'er again Christ receive a sinful Make the message clear and plain. Christ receive a sinful men. Come and he will give you rest. Trust him for his word. The <clears throat> sinful men sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive the 
The song says men, it also includes women. So, our closing song is number 583. Good old song. Sing to me of heaven. Let's go out with a song in our heart. Sing to me of heaven. Sing that song of peace. From the toils that bind me, it will bring relief. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessings or my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk along, dreaming of the comrades that so Sing to me of heaven's sweetest 
Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. Father, we ask that uh, you go with us through this evening. We ask the prayers on all the sick of our number. Father, we give you thanks for the word of God. We also thank uh, you for Kerry and allowing him to preach the word and uh, bring us these truths. Father, we ask you to continue to watch over us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. Satan does not want us to know. Seeds full of doubt is what he sows. He is the adversary. Call on the name of Jesus. Follow the way that Jesus shows. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. People will say you cannot know, that is just disbelief they show. I believe Jesus when he tells us that we can know the truth and the truth will set us free. God is not the author of confusion, the devil is, the devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. God, he has told us in his word that he has given us a sword. With it expose the arrows, cut fables with a fervor. Point to his unity, the Lord. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. <laughs>